we are extremely pleased to present an extended story on Thumb Winds End of the Road in Michigan podcast. Maybe some of you have followed our posts on the major Indian trails in Michigan. Of all of them, the Saginaw Trail is considered one of the oldest and established trails and its route is followed by today's well-known roads and highways. Starting from Detroit at Woodward, then on to Dixie Highway through Drayton Plains and Waterford, and then onward on US-10. We have found a special story from that trail, from the days prior to the major settlement of Michigan. And we think it's well worth sharing. In 1831, two 26-year-old, French aristocrats, Alexis de Tocqueville, and Gustave de Beaumont, decided to strike out, in what today's terms, would be the ultimate road trip. Namely, traveling overland from Detroit, to the last white settlement in the Northwest Territories, to Saginaw, Michigan. It's a fascinating tale, but be forewarned. It contains the ethnocentrism, laced with the tone of superior racism, that was all too common in those days. However, it also offers a historic keyhole view of what Michigan was like in 1831, like no other author has conveyed. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's tale from the end of the road. Today's story is taken from, an extract from the memoir, letter, and remarks of Alexis de Tocqueville. Translated from the French, by the translator of Napoleon's correspondence with King Joseph. Specifically, A Fortnight in the Wilderness. Written on board the Steamboat Superior, August of 1831. Part 1, The Desire to See the Wilds of the Northwest Before it was Settled. One of the things we were most curious about on arriving in America, was to visit the extreme limits of European civilization, and, if we had time, even some of the Indian tribes which have preferred flying to the wildest wilderness to accommodating themselves to what the white man calls the enjoyments of social life. But to reach the wilderness has become more difficult than might be supposed. After we left New York and advanced towards the Northeast, our destination seemed to flee before us. We traversed places celebrated in Indian history, we reached valleys named by them, we crossed streams still called by the names of their tribes, but everywhere the wigwam had given way to the house, the forest had fallen, where there had been solitude there was now life. Still, we seemed to be treading in the steps of the aborigines. Ten years ago we were told they were here, five years ago, they were there, two years ago, there. Where you see the most beautiful church in the village, someone said to us, and I cut down the first tree in the forest. Here, said another, was held the High Council of the Iroquois Confederation. And what has become of the Indians? I asked. Our host replied. The Indians are gone, I know not whither, beyond the Great Lakes, the race is becoming extinct, they are not made for civilization, it kills them. Man becomes accustomed to everything, to death on the battlefield, in the hospital, to kill and to suffer. Use familiarizes with all scenes. An ancient people, the first and legitimate masters of the American continent, melts away every day from the earth, as snow before the sun, and disappears. Another race rises in its place with still more astonishing rapidity, before this race, the forests fall, the marshes dry up, vast rivers and lakes extensive as seas, in vain oppose its triumph and progress. Wilderness becomes villages, villages towns. The American, who daily witnesses these marvels sees nothing surprising in them. This incredible destruction, and still more astonishing progress, seem to him to be the ordinary course of events. He considers them as laws of nature. It is thus that, always on the search for savages and wilderness, we traveled over the 360 miles between New York and Buffalo. A large body of Indians collected at Buffalo, they were to receive payment for the land that they have given up to the United States. This was the first observation that struck us. I do not think that I ever was more completely disappointed, than by the appearance of these Indians. I was full of recollections of Chateaubriand and Cooper, and I expected, in the countenances of these aborigines, of America, to discover some traces of the lofty virtues engendered by the spirit of liberty. I thought to see men whose bodies, developed by war, and the chase, lost nothing by the absence of cover. My astonishment may be estimated, on comparing these anticipations with the following description. These Indians were short, their limbs, so far as could be seen, under their clothes, were meager, their skins, instead of being, as is generally supposed, a red copper color, were dark, 
almost like those of mulattoes. Their black and shining hair fell straight down their necks and shoulders. Their mouths were in general immoderately large. The mean and malicious expression of their countenances showed the depth of depravity that prolonged abuse of the benefits of civilization alone can give. One would have taken them for men from the dregs of our great European towns, and yet they were savages. The vices which they had caught from us were mixed with rude barbarism, which made them a hundred times more revolting. These Indians were unarmed, they wore European clothes but put on differently from ours. It was evident that they were unaccustomed to them, and that they felt imprisoned in their folds. To the ornaments of Europe, they joined barbarous finery, feathers, enormous earrings, and necklaces of shells. Their movements were quick and irregular, their voices sharp and discordant, their looks wild and restless. At first sight, they might have been taken for wild animals, tamed to resemble men, but still brutal. These feeble and degraded creatures belonged, however, to one of the most celebrated tribes of ancient America. We had before us, and it is a sad fact, the last remains of the famous confederation of the Iroquois, whose keen sense was as renowned as their courage, and who long held the balance between the two greatest European nations. Still, it would be wrong to judge the Indian race from this imperfect specimen, like the cuttings of a wild tree that has grown up in the mud of our towns. We made this mistake and afterward had to correct it. In the evening, we walked out of the town. At a short distance from the last houses, we saw an Indian lying by the side of the road. He was a young man. He lay still, and we thought he was dead. Some stifled sighs which escaped with difficulty from his chest proved to us that he yet lived, and was struggling against the fatal drunkenness produced by brandy. The sun had already set, the ground was growing damper and damper, it was clear that, without help, he would die on the spot. The Indians were leaving Buffalo for their villages, from time to time, a group of them passed close to us. As they passed, they brutally turned over the body of their countrymen to see who it was, and walked on without attending to what we said. Most of them were themselves drunk. At length, came an Indian girl who seemed to approach with some interest. I thought that she was the wife or the sister of the dying man. She looked at him attentively, called him aloud by his name, felt his heart, and, having ascertained that he was alive, tried to rouse him from his lethargy. But as her efforts were fruitless, we saw her become enraged with the lifeless body that lay before her. She struck him on the head, pulled about his face, and trampled on him. With these brutal acts, she mixed wild inarticulate cries, which I seemed to have still in my ears. We thought that we ought to interfere, and we ordered her away. She obeyed, but we heard her burst into a fit of savage laughter as she went off. When we returned to the town, we talked to several people of the young Indian. We spoke of his imminent danger, we offered to pay his expenses in an inn. It was useless. We could persuade no one to care about him. Some said, these men are accustomed to drinking to excess and to sleep on the ground, and they do not die of such accidents. Others owned that the Indian probably would die, but evidently, there rose to their lips the half-expressed thought, what is the life of an Indian? Such was a general feeling. In this society, so proud of its morality and philanthropy, one meets with complete insensibility, with a cold uncompassionate egotism, when the aborigines are in question. The inhabitants of the United States do not hunt the Indians with cries and horns, as the Spaniards used to do in Mexico. But an unpitying instinct inspires here as elsewhere the European race. How often in the course of our travels we met with honest citizens, who said to us, as they sat quietly in the evening at their firesides, every day the number of the Indians is diminishing, it is not that we often make war upon them, but the brandy which we sell to them at a low price, carries off every year more than our arms could destroy. This western world belongs to us, they added, God, by refusing to these first inhabitants the power of civilization, has predestined them to destruction. The real owners of this continent are those who know how to turn their resources to account. Satisfied by this reasoning, the American goes to church to hear a minister of the gospel repeat to him that all men are brothers and that the Almighty, who made them all on the same model, has imposed on all the duty of helping each other. This concludes this week's special edition story. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Thumb Wind's End of the Road podcast. If you like this kind of story, you are invited to join other monthly visitors on our website at thumbwind.com. Please watch for, 
and download next week's continuation of Alexis de Tocqueville's Saginaw Trail story next Sunday evening. Please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and give us a review. From the end of the road. Have a great day.